Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to show you how money printing helps the rich and hurts everybody else. If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works, so you can learn how to make money in bull and bear markets and protect your family from the crisis that's coming, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So I want to start with a typical thing that I get in the mail. Uh, I graduated from Stanford. I was an undergraduate there. And so occasionally I get these magazines with uh, these wonderful trips in Europe and Asia and South America and all, all really all over the world. And uh, I'm always shocked by one thing about them. I've actually never gone on any of these. Here's an example. This is just a nice uh, hike with a Stanford faculty member uh, hiking around the uh, northern coastline of France um, from, Bit from Brittany all the way to Normandy. You would think this is uh, fairly reasonable. Uh, professors usually don't get paid like investment bankers. Uh, and uh, this is a hiking trip. This isn't a luxury uh, cruise or a luxury trip at very expensive hotels. But when you dig down and look at the price of this, it's, uh, it turns out it's $10,000 per person, uh, double occupancy. So if I were to take my wife and three kids, this would cost us anywhere from, uh, it would cost us approximately $50,000 to go on this this walking trip with Stanford, uh, and that doesn't include airfare. So just $50,000 for the trip and food, not including airfare. So once you factor in airfare, uh, it'd be quite, quite expensive. I'll probably add another, uh, at least another $10,000 to that. So $60,000 for a walking trip. Now this is incredible. Uh, you never used to see things like this, but I don't mean to pick on Stanford, obviously Yale, Princeton, Harvard, uh, a lot of these schools have trips like this. And they're targeted, uh, targeted mainly to uh, to wealthy wealthy graduates. Now these have sort of come out of nowhere in the last uh, 20 years. These kind of trips never used to uh, never used to exist. Now let's compare this with inflation of normal goods. We know that the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, targets inflation rates at the consumer level of roughly two percent. Now I'm going to show you some prices at the the producer level, so sort of the uh, the wholesale level, uh, but I think uh, this is still um, interesting to look at. Here's the uh, the uh, the inflation uh, rate for bread and bakery, bread and bakeries. Uh, so basically, bread manufacturing. If you uh, and this is put out by the Fed. If you plug these numbers into a uh, finance calculator to calculate the uh, annual rate of return of inflation of bread, uh, and I'm not sure what kind of bread this is, it's obviously not fancy bread, uh, it's probably not the same bread that people who go on these sort of trips, uh, th these sort of trips consume, but uh, it's the inflation's about 3%, so a little bit higher than what's been targeted at the consumer level. So what I would propose is that we, ha we live in a society where wealth inequality is one of these very big issues. But I would suggest that sort of average middle class, working class people spend their money on different things than rich people do. I happen to be wealthy. I'm part of the 1%. Uh, and so you can, I've sort of seen uh, both sides of it, especially from an economic, um, an economic perspective. I grew up actually fairly, fairly middle class. So you have this weird bifurcated economy where you have these just really crazy trips. Like I would, I have the money to do this, but I would probably uh, never spend, uh, never spend fifty or sixty thousand dollars for a walking trip. I could just bring YouTube along and walk along the coastline for a lot, a lot less. And so you have this enormous, these kind of enormous expenses, and then you have uh, fairly. Everyone always tells us the inflation rate's been fairly low, uh, the CPI's been low, etc. Over the last few years, and yet you have all this money printing. So we're going to kind of keep circling around this idea. We're going to talk more about the CPI index, what is the real inflation rate, etc., uh, in a later lecture. But in this lecture, I want to suggest that different uh, different classes, different economic classes, have different inflation rates. And so this is we, we're kind of living in a society that's very close to uh, Marie Antoinette uh, before the French Revolution, when she was uh, told that the peasants were starving, that they did not have bread. She uh, rather naively said, I think she was, she must have been 13 or 14 at the time, if in fact she actually said that. She said, oh, they don't have bread. Well, why don't they just eat cake? And I think this is, uh, we've sort of circled back to this on the way that our elites think about the middle class and the working class. And I'm going to show you how the economy is set up and how money printing is set up to disproportionately 
benefit the rich. Now here we are talking about the price of bread. These are uh, more like the kinds of bread that really wealthy people buy. Um, I don't buy this sort of stuff, but it's interesting to see a, a loaf of bread for $120 a loaf. Uh, and then the next, second most expensive loaf is about is $97, so call it $100 a loaf. What makes these breads so expensive, apart from the fact that they're marketed to really wealthy people, is the fact that they include scarce assets. This is sort of the end of the fiat system. This is the most extreme version here, where you're actually eating scarce assets. So gold leaf bread, you're actually eating gold, which is one of the scarcest things on earth, has a very, very high stock to flow. And you're also in the second, um, in the second loaf of bread, you're eating, uh, it has a little bit of gold, 23 karat red gold, but it also has very rare champagne in it, which is also a scarce ha asset, sort of a traditional, um, traditional old uh, French champagne. So we have this economy where sort of regular people eat a certain kind of bread and that, that those inflation rates perhaps have not been going up that much. It's very difficult to trust the, the statistics. And then we have an economy where uh, a family vacation, just a hiking trip is $60,000. We see this as well in real estate, uh, this new listing in Malibu uh, for $125 million. Looks like a gorgeous house uh, right on the coast overlooking uh, the Malibu beach. So we, we have kind of a bifurcated economy where rich people buy certain things like uh, college tuition at Stanford or trips at Stanford or bread made with champagne or gold, Malibu houses, etc. And then you have sort of normal people buying bread that's not going up that much in price. Now I think this can be explained using the Cantillon effect or perhaps I should say Cantillon effect. Uh, Richard Cantillon was an Irish French economist wrote this famous book called The Essay on the Nature of Trade. Uh, I believe he's actually responsible as well for coining the word entrepreneur, but a very smart guy. And we get the the, uh, the phrase, the Cantillon. In English, people usually say Cantillon effect. Uh, the Cantillon effect basically says that those people in a country that are closest to the point of money creation get to see their incomes rise first, and they benefit the most from money creation. So the old days, I think when uh, Cantillon was writing about this, he was looking at people who were close to um, close to the French king. Obviously, if you were in the court or had these sort of connections, if there was new money printed, uh, I believe Cantillon lived under the time of John Law, which was one of the first kind of paper fiat systems. But those who are closest to the point of, point of money creation see their incomes rise first. And then they can spend that money on it's usually on what rich people spend it on. So in 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 the French court, I imagine it would have been uh, perhaps having more servants or, or special kinds of food, maybe maybe gold, uh, gold bread as well. Uh, that so in the French court, what he's writing, he actually writes about a, another group too. Would be those people who are closest to a gold mine. So maybe uh, you're in the ruling class in Spain or Portugal, and you have this. Uh, gold being shipped in from the new world. And so these are the people, this is back when gold was more of a primary form of money. The closer you are to the, to the, the, the source of the money printing, whether it's the central bank printing money in the US or whether it's money being dug out of the ground in the form of gold or money being created by the early central bankers uh, who are closely tied to the French court, those closest to the point of money creation get rich first. In our day and age, these are people in finance and people in high tech. The people in high tech get rich because their stocks are high growth stocks and uh, they do disproportionately well in an era of really low interest rates. Obviously, people in finance uh, make a lot of money. This is my own background. I have a hedge fund background. Um, hedge funds, private equity, investment bankers, uh, people also who happen to own the most stocks. So once people become really wealthy, they can only buy so many yachts and so many jets. And so even uh, if you look at the uh, Forbes list of billionaires, uh, a lot of these creators, people even like, like Bill Gates or the Google guys, they keep a lot of their wealth in the original stock that they own or they, uh, or they diversify and buy a, a basket, of, uh, basket of stocks. So the Cantillon effect says those closest to the point of money creation really benefit from money printing. 
those further away from the point of money creation, whether it's the gold mine or the central bank or Wall Street, they see their purchasing power decline. So the people who work for the hedge funds uh, can buy up all the, the real estate, they can buy the nice bread, and those furthest away, especially if there is residual inflation that seeps into the system, they see their purchasing power decline. So if, for example, uh, the people in the French court get really rich from the money printing and start buying a lot of servants, we would see um, possibly general prices as servant salaries go up. If there's a shortage of servants, we could see servant salaries go up and then they start spending more on uh, bread and milk and you get sort of general uh, consumer price inflation. But what I want to suggest here is that a lot of the, whether inflation makes its way into the system, into the sort of consumer price system, also depends on what the very wealthy do with their money. So if they save it in stocks, the money is not really making its way into the real economy. Uh, if they spend it on Malibu houses, this creates price inflation uh, in California coastal real estate. It doesn't necessarily create inflation in the, uh, the median price of a U.S. home if you're looking at median prices rather than mean or average prices. And this is what's happened really since the great financial uh, crisis of 2008-2009 when we fought, saw the first money printing, the first quantitative easing by the Fed is that asset prices have risen a lot, but at least at the consumer price level, the CPI index, we haven't seen a whole lot of inflation. Now I'm gonna talk more about the CPI index. There are problems with it obviously as well, but let's just assume that it's roughly right and we've been seeing inflation of one uh, to 3% or so over the last 10 years. This would make sense because the group, according to the Cantillon effect, who's benefited the most from quantitative easing has been the wealthy they tend to put it into uh, Stanford trips, as we saw, uh, gold, gold bread, and uh, coast, California coastal real estate. So these have gone up in price, whereas the price of your average uh, bread has not gone up, uh, has not gone up very much. Now, it, this this makes a lot of sense. Simply, uh, the more wealthy you become, there's only only so much milk you can drink, so many eggs you can eat. Maybe you upgrade from. Uh, really cheap eggs to uh, pasture, uh, free-range uh, organic chicken eggs or something like that. And so you would see more inflation in these kind of high-end foods, the kind you find at Whole Foods or specialty shops. And then uh, basically Kroger's, Safeway, Basic, uh, or, or Walmart or Target, uh, bread and milk and eggs would not see a lot of price inflation. So this is basically, this is how money printing helps the rich. I want to give you a little win to, window into who's doing the money printing and what their motivations might be. So we just saw yesterday that the Fed's going to be, begin buying individual corporate bonds to prop up the economy. The S&P was down about 2.5% before this announcement came up. It slowly rallied throughout the day and ended up uh, finishing quite strong. It's up again quite strongly in the wake of this. When you put a floor on on uh, corporate bonds, it helps riskier assets such as equities, which are uh, a little, uh, uh, I don't know if you wanna say higher up or lower down, but more risky in the, uh, in, the capital, uh, in the capital structure. So when the Fed prints money, buys treasuries, buys munis, buys corporate bonds, even buys junk bonds, this helps, uh, this disproportionately helps people who own more real estate and own more stocks and own more corporate bonds. These tend to be people who are wealthy already or people who work in finance, as we said. So let's take a look at our chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. Seems like a, uh, seems like a friendly guy. None of this is meant to impugn him personally, but uh, I'm disturbed by where our central bankers come from and who they're possibly working for. Obviously, Jerome Powell's a, a very wealthy guy. I believe he has somewhere between 10 and 50 million uh, in, uh, in assets, according to the reporting. And this is mostly invested, as you'd guess, in, in probably in corporate bonds and in stocks. So if we take a look at Jerome Powell's background, he started off uh, as a lawyer, uh, became an investment banker. And then uh, we see the sort of revolving door between government and Wall Street and think tanks and central banks, which is so disturbing. He left the central bank, went and worked for the treasury, uh, and then came back 
and worked for another bank, Bankers Trust, which actually, when he was there, they got into trouble because of a bunch of uh, derivatives losses. And then he seamlessly moved to a private equity group called the Carlyle Group, whom you've probably heard about, and then started his own private investment firm. So here's a guy who's sort of bounced back and forth uh, between the private world of Wall Street and the uh, quote unquote public world of government. But basically, you have the same people on uh, both sides of the door. Uh, Alan Greenspan, after he left being the chairman of the Fed, I saw him speak. Uh, I saw him speak in Florida to a group of uh, people associated with Wall Street. And I think he was getting paid a few hundred thousand dollars for literally a ten minute, uh, a ten minute speech, and then he shook hands with everyone, uh, which he definitely uh, he probably wouldn't be doing in the time of COVID, but. This is the revolving door we have between where the money's created and how it's distributed to wealthy people. We have someone like Jerome Powell, who has this investment banking, private equity background. We have him basically overseeing the Fed purchasing corporate bonds, which will help the stock market, which will help private equity firms, other investment firms. It'll help, um, it'll help all the investment bankers, all the hedge fund guys, all the private equity guys. And this is his background. So again, no one's better than their incentives, but this is a, a prime example of how the Cantillon effect works today. This is the guy at the center of the money printing at the point of the money creation. It, what he does uh, is, is, I suppose it's legal, but it, it disproportionately helps the rich, including all the people he used to uh, work with at the Carlisle Group and uh, and elsewhere. And this is one reason we have to understand that quantitative easing and money printing where the central bank creates new money and buys assets with it, that it disproportionately helps the wealthy. And that's why we've seen, it's one of the major reasons we've seen wealth inequality grow over the last 40 years. It has to do with low interest rates. It has to do with a lot of money printing going on. And that money printing first finding its hands into the rich and not really trickling down to everyone else, at least not yet. Hope you guys found this helpful. If you did, please hit the subscribe and like button. Let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.